Okay, thank you everybody for coming here. Um, when we started, restarted the curriculum series uh, this semester, we actually wanted to make sure that we had uh, a very diverse curriculum, right, that all the different aspects of our uh, academic lives are covered. And of course, one very important aspect of it is education. We are, after all, an education, educating institution. And so we wanted to make sure not only we do research, but we know how to train the next generation of researchers, have, and to as well generate very good grads and undergrads. And so today, that's going to be the topic of this colloquium. Uh, we also wanted to see uh, what other experiences other universities had. Uh, and for that, today, we're going to hear about the experience of University of Texas Austin uh, and what they did with their undergrad education. And so for that, today, we have Dr. Sasha Kopp. Uh, Dr. Sasha has uh, been, uh, he did his studies as a PhD and undergrad even uh, in the University of Chicago. He then went to Syracuse. He did his postdoctoral uh, work in there. He worked on neutrinos. He worked on, on CP violation. He even started on CDF on run zero in, as an undergrad. Um, and so he's now shifted his attention after uh, a very long and successful high energy physics career to education. And he's become the now the associate dean uh, of the College of Natural Sciences at UT, Houston, UT Austin. And please welcome Sasha Kopp. And before we begin, we have a little gift for you. It's a pointer. It's a pointer with your name in there. Wow. And there you go. That's for you. Cool. You can use it right now. Excellent. And Thank you. And like that one. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Cool. Wow. All right. Um, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, could I just ask how many of us are students here in the crowd? And how many of us are faculty here? Okay, good. So I'm talking to really a good cross-section of the department. Um, I'm going to start... Uh, it's just a little personal story uh, about myself and how I got into the topic of today's talk and then uh, try to introduce what I did to cope with the topic of today's talk uh, and then kind of get to a certain under level of understanding about what the topic of the talk really should have been before I wrote it and then I realized at the end. Um, I became associate chair for undergraduate studies in our physics department after Professor Mel Oakes retired after being in our department for approximately 500 years. He was loved by every student. Every student went through his uh, sophomore waves and optics class. He personally knew every student's name. He knew their parents' names. He knew everything about them. He made sure they were in the right place at the right time. He was everyone's grandfather. And so here comes an assistant professor charged by the chairman to be the new associate chair for undergraduate studies. Uh, I was flying back and forth between Fermilab outside Chicago and Austin. Uh, I said, sure, I'll do that. I think I could probably manage. Uh, but I had no idea what I was getting into. And I started talking to some of the students. And I said, so tell me, this is at graduation, tell me some of the favorite classes that you took here. Um, and they started naming things like philosophy. And they, someone took a really great architecture class. And someone else took a really great English class. and. And I was trying to write little bios of some of these students because we we're going to give them a really prestigious award. They were our best students in the department. And they were all talking about these really great experiences they had somewhere else. <laughs> so I thought, well, what kind of job did I just take? Um, and then I started uh, asking them, well, did you have a particularly important experience in physics? Can I write about that? And I said, mm, no. no. <laughs> I thought I was in trouble. Um, and then I started looking out the, down the list. I had taught uh, our senior quantum mechanics class uh, for a number of years. That has about 30 people in it, or did at that time. And I thought, that's great. We're putting out 30 majors. And some, uh, I guess it was my wife, said, well, how many undergrads are there at UT anyway? I said, there's 35,000. She said, well, that's not very impressive. How do you put out 
35 undergraduate physics majors. That's, what is that? That's 0.1%. Or something. So that gave me some pause. And I looked down the list because now I had a list of all the undergraduate majors. I found out there were 80 or more undergraduate freshman physics majors, but 35 graduating. Where'd they all go? I thought, well, okay, so there's three things I don't know. Why is it they don't like us? Where'd they all go? And how come we only put out 35 out of 30, 35,000 students in the entire university? I thought, oh, I gotta learn something. So this sort of set off a troubling series of events for me. And um, I will tell you that what I wanted to do is just flat out uh, get involved in getting more physics majors. I didn't come to think about the actual charge of what I was trying to do, which was improve what we were offering the physics majors until later. Um, but in the, in the spirit of just trying to get more and, and market to students, I actually turned to a marketer. And so a lot of the language I'm going to start talking with here at the beginning of this is really the language of market research because, well, that's where I got started. But then I, by the end of this talk, I want to get to the language of academic community, which I think is really what this whole project came to be about because that's what we were failing to offer. So uh, with that long preamble, let me just say a little bit about UT Austin's physics program. Probably not very different from Texas A&M. Um, we would walk around and strut our stuff and say, we're a very highly ranked physics department. We have some ranking in US News World Report. Um, we have a lot of undergraduates that uh, graduate to top graduate programs. They go to Stanford, they go to MIT, they go to all these great places, and that's how we measure ourselves. Um, and there's lots of graduate students that want to come here. Lots of people say they want to work for Steven Weinberg and they can't get to work with him, so I get PhD students that way and that all worked out well. Uh, but then there are some things that just don't sit right. At the time I got started as, as associate chair, there were 200 majors in physics in our entire college. Um, that was not the smallest department in the entire college, but pretty darn near close to it. There was astronomy just down there one step lower than us. Uh, but I guess if you merge the two together, could come out a little bit better. But compare that to the 3,500, which is now 4,500, by the way, biology majors in our college. Well, I guess that doesn't make us too popular. Uh, or computer science, which has something like, uh, well, actually, now this number is old. It's 1,600 majors. Okay, So obviously, computer science is going on some bubble right now because of the tech economy that we live in. But clearly not the first destination uh, of choice for undergraduates in the science college. That was kind of odd. The other is that we had lots and lots of incoming freshmen and not so many outgoing seniors. And where do they all leave? The faculty would say, well, they just weren't cut out for physics. I wanted to really know that for myself. Um, and others would then walk away with this experience of their best experience in college was their architecture class, not the physics program they went through. And they didn't necessarily have great things to say about the courses that they took with us. And so this is sort of a... I guess you call them dark clouds. That would be a fair way to say it. All right? But maybe not unusual. And as I've given this talk at other departments around the country, um, I don't feel like the, our experiences are particularly unusual. They're not necessarily great. They're not necessarily bad. But they are to be paid attention to. So let me just pose some questions. Because these are kinds of questions that marketers ask. So the first question this marketer asked me is, so you want to increase the number of majors in your department. Why do you want to do that? Well, I thought that was an obvious question. But I thought the answer was obvious. Um, and now I'm asking all of you, you know, is this something that's a goal? And really, why would we want to do that? And then I could ask some other questions. For example, students, you could ask, what are your expectations of the department that you're going to get your major in? What kinds of things are you looking for? Is the department that you're currently in helping you meet those expectations? Or is it helping you get to those places that you want to get to? This is a big one. If physics is your major, do you know? could you name a few ca careers that comes out of a physics major? Name five. Think about that. For a lot of students, they come into physics because they had a particularly uh, excellent high school teacher, and that got them all excited in their major. And they come to college, and they see a different model, let's say. And 
you can ask the students, do you see the same passion for instruction that you saw in your high school teachers? Because we have dual careers here in the university. Right? Now, for those of us who are faculty, imagine asking the same questions of, of your faculty colleagues. Would you get the same answers as the students would have given you? Would they acknowledge the validity of the students, question, uh, students' answers to the questions? And would they acknowledge the validity of the questions themselves? There was a very uh, important moment in our own, I'll call it, identity formation around this whole process where we were doing a lot of research amongst our students and then trying to present that to some of the faculty colleagues uh, in the department. And truly, some of them felt like the answers weren't important. Like what the students thought wasn't the most important answer, it's what the faculty thought that was the most important answer. And I remember this fellow that I hired to work on this with me, he asked, you know, so ultimately who's the customer in your product? And one of the faculty members said, well, the customer is the person at the graduate school at which I'm going to place the student that comes out of this program. That's the customer. And I don't want to evaluate whether that was right or wrong, although I have an opinion about it. But I'm going to suggest that the question isn't, doesn't have a unique answer, and it might not amongst all the people in this room. And the fact that this person, this faculty member, colleague of mine, was so definite about his answer drove all the answers to these questions. Okay. So as I said, this has a funny start to it, because I got involved by uh, in, in being a chair by uh, hiring literally a market research person. And this individual, a uh, fellow by the name of John Rice, who had done a lot of work in higher ed, probably the most experienced person in higher ed that I'm aware of. And so there was an intersection that was very uncomfortable for us at the beginning where I needed to address things with data rather than just opinions. Because faculty are great for having opinions about various topics. Students, you probably have noticed this. And sometimes, even though we're all empirical scientists and in our work with vacuum chambers and atoms, we're very good about letting the data suggest to us where we should go, in the educational process, we often let our preconceived notions tell us where to go. And we try really hard to either not ask the questions that would result in data, or if there is data, turn the other way so as to avoid the uncomfortable truths that might come about. So I'm saying this only in my department. I wouldn't mean to ever suggest it of any place else. But there are things that can be done to acquire data. And some of it has the tools of market research to it. And my first instinct was, I'm an experimental scientist. I would like data to attach to any programmatic change we, get, we come up with. And that was where market research came. But market, research, market researchers bring with them lots of other baggage that we academicians uh, don't nor normally feel comfortable around because they start asking questions about customers and product and motivation. And actually, those turn out to be really, really good questions, but I just didn't recognize it at the time. So uh, here's the market research questions. If the students are the customer, and I think that's the correct answer, what attracted them to the product, we being the product, uh, the, the university and the major, what is it that keeps them loyal to the product? And for that other group of students that I was referring to, the freshmen who didn't finish, what drove them away from the product? Again, very very stilted in a certain language, but bear with me if you would, because I think we'll get back to a, a language that even academicians would understand or be all comfortable with. And then for those of us who are the deliverers of the product, how is it that we want to respond to the feedback we're going to get? Because this is going to be data. and we always have to choose what we're, what we're going to do with the data. So we basically decided that the students weren't very happy. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you the data that showed, suggested that wasn't that wasn't a wild conclusion. Um, and here's another not so surprising statement: the kinds of students that we expect to come in the door are the kinds of students that we, the professors, often were 40 years ago or 20 years ago or however many years ago is that we're willing to admit it was when we were in college. And we're replicating an educational model that was very comfortable to us back then, 
because we went through that educational pro process. And in fact, many conversations that you'll have with faculty will, will look something, when it comes to education, will look something like this. Well, when I was a student, it was done like this, and I'm here, so it must have been good. I'm going to do that too. And that's great, except we represent as faculty one five sigma effect on some bell curve of the entire educational system, and that's not a good or bad evaluation. It's just that we are not the mean value of what we're trying to achieve as higher education in the country. We could survive in that model, but maybe not everyone will learn the same way. So when I think about this uh, reach out to customers, it was very much driven by, from a perspective of, I know what I wanted when I was a student, but I really don't know what today's student wants because I'm old and I'm an old fart. And I frankly am not doing it physics for the same reason that the students today are doing physics, or at least not all of them. So I, I wanted data. And I wanted to know what it is that the students wanted at the end of this product, uh, the, the end of this process. And then there's sort of the inside baseball of this, which is I know that if we don't have customers, we don't have the need for the product. And for those of us in physics departments who have not as many majors, it's worth asking, you know, can we justify our reason for being here? So we had focus groups. This is data collection when you're a market researcher. Lots and lots of focus groups. I wanted really large amounts of students going through these focus groups because I wanted a statistically significant set, set of data. I, I used those terms back then because that was kind of cute. That's what particle physicists do. Uh, but that turns out to be irrelevant. Um, I did end up getting about a third of our physics majors going through focus groups. And I got another 30 or 40 students who rejected the major. They started out as freshmen and ended up leaving because that data turns out to be very useful to us as well. And so here's some things that they said. And you could just take it as this is criticisms of UT Austin's physics department. Professors don't seem to have a passion for physics, and they don't discuss it. Not without a role. Without a role model, it's hard for students to identify their own passions for physics. Professors never make connections between physics and other scientific discipline and topics to, or physics related careers. Actually, that comment's about me. Some of the students that went through these focus groups, they were the pre meds that took my, my pre med physics class. One of them happens to be the wife of one of our faculty. And she went through my class and I said, hey, could you, would you mind being in this focus group? Well, here I was teaching my physics class and I never really bothered to make all the connections to biology that maybe a pre-med would be interested in. But, hey, so that was me. Uh, professors don't tie classes to their research. Uh, students feel lost and professors don't care whether they get it or not. There's a disconnect between intro physics and modern physics. What's the connection? Students are majoring physics to pursue the why. I am selectively pr pr pulling out some feedback from a variety of things, but most of these kids were majors or ex-majors who got frustrated. So this is what we did for our very best. And some of these things are really understandable. Um, you know, when we don't tie things to our research, well, by golly, we got to do our inclined planes and pulleys, and we got to do free body diagrams. That's intro physics, right? Mm -hmm. And it leads to some of the other stuff. We don't have time to do to talk about the research. And it leads to some of this other frustration down here, right? A lot of students, they get into physics because they heard about Stephen Hawking, and they heard about Steven Weinberg, and they read the first three minutes, and they got all these really cool exposures to things that sound like physics. And then they get to college, and it's inclined planes and pulleys for the first two years. Holy cow. OK, let's, just because those were two. Um, washed over, let me give you the actual quote. So it would have been really neat to have a freshman design class that we went hand in hand with the first and second semester physics classes. That would be something where you could get to create your own stuff. It's so much fun to get your hands dirty. That's a good positive comment. In physics, every class is required to do the next class. In biology, you can take a couple classes and then take whatever you want. People take graduate neuroscience classes in sophomore year as a biology major. There's problems with that when it comes to physics, but there's something underlying this comment that's really important which is we never really make any one class of value by itself. It's always linked to being important for the next class. Physics professors don't pull students in. They don't 
uh, sell other opportunities. Someone in physics as an undergrad doesn't necessarily have to go to grad school. Actually, that's quite important, too. I'm trying to think about a ballpark estimate of the number of faculty of any discipline in any university in the entire United States. The order of magnitude must be in the millions, give or take. And the number of people in the United States, 300 million. So faculty are a 1% of factor smaller. And yet, we tend to think of our courses as preparing the next generation of faculty. So this one is kind of a big thing. Um, Name a specific professor. It was criminal. He recited things out of the book. I did not know what was going on in there, and I was resenting this person because I'm not learning. He damaged some very good physics students' motivation. Actually, this is one of those kids, turns out, who had one of those really great high school teachers. And the high school teacher was the type of person who would get them involved and get them making things or get them breaking things. And what do you do when you come to college? You sit in a room like this. Right? That's your typical exposure. But here's something that actually turns out to be really important. A lot, and I mean a lot, of the students who were the sort of juniors and seniors in physics, when they remembered back to why it was they got involved in physics in the beginning, they said something about the why. Physics helps you pursue the why. All of them said this. They were actually able to address in real terms what other majors do. Physics is about the why, how, why things work. Engineering is just making things work. And so they had a real distinction in their own minds about why physics was attractive. It's the why. And that's a unique value. So actually, that became a brand. We literally decided, if you're going to try to articulate what physics most of our students couldn't tell you five careers that you get out of being a physics major. In fact, there's many careers. But you have to be able to sell what the program of work is all about. We decided it's to tell you it's the, it's the discipline that allows you to discover the why, why things work. So this is where we go back to market research again. Yes? Oh, okay. Um, you're bringing up a really important question. So there's, I'll make two, two distinctions of the kind of data we got. There's the data about what is it that they value, and then there's the data about what is it they're frustrated about or disappointed about in particular about what they actually saw. So when we wanted to go out there with a positive message, you want to have a, a brand about what it is that we're all about as a physics department, because everyone coming out of high school can tell you what it means to be an engineer, or they can tell you, because they saw it on TV, what it means to be a doctor. They couldn't tell you what it means to be a physicist. So I needed that message. And then, on the inside, we have to fix all the other stuff, this very large collection of stuff that also turns out to have a very single uh, interpretation to it of what's wrong with all this other stuff. And that other stuff, it goes very simply into community. So I'll leave you that word, too. So why on the one hand and community on the other? Okay. So to make a brand, you have to set a tone and you have to make a message. And that message has to be conspicuous because we're trying to attract majors. And this is another thing that physicists don't seem to be very good at doing in our campus. If you're going to go and try to market the thing, don't market it in your own building. Market it where it counts, the people who are not currently your majors. I knew I was making progress when the Department of Germanic Studies called my chairman and they were pissed off because I had put flyers on every door, in every bathroom stall, in every lecture hall, on every console, and in every chalkboard in their building. I had gotten my message out somewhere else. I felt pretty good about that. So did my chairman. So this is about trying to reach out to the students where they are. And so it's important to know what they want. College students want to know what they can do with their degree. In fact, this turns out to be one of the biggest challenges in all STEM education 
of any type, not, less, not just physics, but we're trying to make students slog it through some pretty hard stuff. It's challenging to go be a physics major or a biology major or a statistics major. It's easy to go over there to government and liberal arts. And so we've got to give them something to hold on to. What is it they're doing with this? And when your majors can't identify the jobs, that's a problem. Our students in the focus groups couldn't name, I said five, they couldn't name two careers that you could do with a physics degree other than be a professor or say something like, I guess you could do research. But they didn't know what that meant. Research where? And students are looking for connections. It's fine to talk about physics as a discipline, but it sort of stands out here as if it's all by itself, whereas other departments like chemistry are talking about how applied they are to matters that seem to really connect to everyday life. There's chemists in our, our college that are talking about curing HIV. There's chemists in our, our college that are talking about uh, antidotes for anthrax. Those all sound like really important societal problems. What does physics do? It discovers the Higgs boson. Not yet. They don't even discover the fixed boson. <laughs> or there's the article that Dave Toback and I were on, which is where we failed to find supersymmetry. 450 physics, yeah, so we just failed even at that. So if they don't understand the connections and they don't understand the motivation, it's really hard to slog it out through that difficult period where you got sophomore physics or you know, freshman physics. You've got to give people the end point. Because they know what it is for being a pre-med or being a computer scientist or being an engineer. It's also important to understand what it is that high school students are thinking about. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about connecting with students on our college campus because I wanted the quick and dirty, I'm going to steal as many physics majors as I can from everyone else. But there's a pipeline issue too. Long term, we have to understand how it is that we connect to high schools. And we have to know what high school thing, kids are thinking about. Well, they're all planning a major in engineering and pre-med and computer science. Not surprising, because they all end up in college campuses doing that, too. Why? Because their advisors are telling them to do that. Why? Because their advisors saw it, doctors and engineers and lawyers on TV, is just like we did. So they know what those careers are about. And the high, the, even the high school counselors can't tell you what the careers in physics are all about. Hell, the high school physics teachers can't tell you what the careers are in physics. So no one seems to know. So if you don't know, it's really hard to sell that as a point. However, and this is always true, the kids who majored in physics, they all love their high school physics class. There's something about it that just made their juices go. Either it's the teacher that let them blow stuff up, or they just got to learn about Stephen Hawking. That kind of stuff made them happy. So if we could just not screw that up, we would have a whole lot of physics majors because they walk around and say how happy they were in that high school physics class to the person, except for like the kids like me who had the, the volleyball coach as a high school te physics teacher. Those kids tend, tend to be a little bit bitter, but most of them walk around happy and they put this smile on their face like, I had this great high school physics teacher. And we have to appreciate something else that uh, all of us as educators know. People's reasons for choosing a major are often, I don't want to say superficial in a negative way, like they're not well thought out, but at 18, there's an awful lot of change ahead. And that's good. And so we don't necessarily have to view things as static here. We have to just appreciate, though, when people get on a campus, they're going to be responding to a variety of stimuli, and some of them are going to look like bright, shiny objects, and that looks kind of cool. And over here, there's going to be physics. And we have to at least be able to articulate what it is we're about and why it would be attractive for someone to major in physics. Because it has to look equally good as being the engineer. I don't mean that in a superficial way. I just mean we have to identify the really cool things you can do as a physics major. So to make this work, took a lot of steps. There's no, I, wanted to walk, I want you to walk away from this uh, presentation today knowing there's no one thing that makes a difference. There's a collection of about 50 small, trivial things that put together make this academic community that I, that I started talking about. So the first thing is I got to my Society for Physics students and we had a lot of chats. I showed them this focus group report. It was massive. 
It showed them all the data. It showed them all the commentary that, that they had made anonymously to this, to this researcher. And I laid it out there. I said, look, looks like we got some problems. It tends to be that we professors, we don't want to admit that there are problems. But I said, I laid it out there. When I wanted to be able to articulate why there's a value in physics, you know, we academicians often put ourselves on the web pages for departments, or we tend to put ourselves on flyers about why major in X, Y, or Z. We say, Professor X, Y, and Z has found the Higgs boson, and that's really great. You could be like him or her. And that's fine, but I wanted students to be able to tell that story because that seems to be what really succeeds. I mean, students want to hear that they can do things at a level that's approachable. They understand, hey, look, that junior over there got to go work with Professor Toback or Professor McIntyre, and that was really great. They could be that person too. So students were really key in providing the examples of what it meant to, to, to represent the department. I tried to communicate very openly with all the students who were taking our courses about what changes we were going to make as a result of this focus group. Again, I think students respond with a certain deal of respect when we, when we treat them with respect. We say, look, we realize we got all this feedback from you. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, and we have to make changes. And I communicated what changes the department was willing to make. And I did that not only for the students who are our majors, but for the students taking our courses. Then I asked the students who were part of these testimonials to go and talk to the classes that were our service classes and also our classes for our majors. Anytime I had an announcement about some event in the physics department, be it a lecture, be it um, uh, a SPS meeting or whatever, we try to go to this class, these classes and take that message out there. Again, this is part of that don't advertise within your own department, advertise where your customers are. And in this case, students taking intro physics classes are a huge customer base. There's, in our department, approximately 3,500 students taking physics at any one time. They're not physics majors, they're pre-meds, they're, bio they're biology majors, they're engineers. We had t-shirts made. Sean, you're wearing one right there. Um, I made as many excuses as I could I'll show you the t-shirt later. It's got a quote from Richard Feynman on it. I won't um, take responsibility for its message. Um, I can just say a Nobel laureate said it, and it's not my fault. Um, but I had a lot of those t-shirts printed, and I found as many ways to get rid of them as I could. On a college campus, when you want to advertise, the worst thing you can do is try to replicate what's done on a national media scale. You can't take out TV advertising. You can't take out radio spots. What do you do? You go for viral marketing. So t-shirts were one. Actually, that number's got a one in front of it now. I've given over almost 2,000 t-shirts like that away. Our building um, is a little different from other physics department buildings. Oh, no, it's not. It stinks. Um, it's a giant cube. It's 17 stories tall. And if you were driving by it, it could have been the architecture building. Oh, no, architectures have a much better building. It could have been the math building, or it could have been the computer science building. It's just a giant 70s era cube. And it is the math building <laughs> and the astronomy building. So much to the mathematicians and the astronomers' chagrin, I branded this building. I tried to graffiti all over it. I made sure that some, someone walking in the building knew it was the physics building. And then I tried as many ridiculous things as I could to make sure that we were being known on campus. As I said, media aren't always the solution, but there are things like the student paper or student discussion fora, or actually, in some cases, local uh, TV. Uh, I try to get a, a physics department in the media quite as often. And it was, some of it was you know, completely accidental, and I won't take credit for it. Oh, well, I will now. Um, there were things like budget cuts being announced in the student paper, and it would say, read things like the McComb School of Business is cutting this and that program due to budget cuts. And then right below, uh, someone had gotten wind of a $500 scholarship I was creating for every freshman who finished our first two courses and was ready to go on to sophomore physics. And all you had to do was get a B in those first two courses. And so it was a recruiting scholarship. That's all it was, plan or a retention scholarship. And so someone thought that was outlandish, and they had a headline about that. So here was the McComb School of Bu Business cutting budget, and here was the physics department 
ready to take you if you weren't if you were cut from the uh, homeschool business. Okay, but I have to emphasize this isn't just marketing. It's hollow if we're just trying to you know sell what do you call a silk purse sow's ear? You, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You got to actually make changes. So. I wanted to respond in an honest way to some of the feedback we were getting. So students said, I don't know how physics relates to everyday life and other careers. So we tried to fix it. One is, we instituted a freshman conference course. If students came in thinking that physics was about Stephen Hawking and all this other stuff and we're going to hit them with inclined planes and pulleys, we had a freshman conference course that was for every freshman. And in small groups, we just tried to meet with them and have them learn about what it is that happens in this department. So if I don't know, Professor Dittmeyer has the world's largest laser. Let's learn about what a laser is. And I asked the students to read a Scientific American article, and then the next week, Professor Dittmeyer would come in. They would talk about lasers and learn why it is you build really big lasers. And the following week, if uh, nanoparticles are a big thing, we read a Scientific American article about that, and we brought in Professor Elaine Lee, and she would have Q&A time about nanoparticles, even though I don't know what that is. It was important because students need to have some light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, God. It's inclined planes and pulleys for a year. The other thing we started was an open house. Literally every lab in our, our giant flash cube building was open for tours. On one day, there were a thousand people walking through the building taking tours of all the research labs. Among them are undergraduate physics majors, but among them a lot more non-majors learning about what it is to do physics. And it's cool because we all have vacuum chambers and lasers and really great stuff and no one knew that you could do that. In fact, people's impressions of engineering is you get to make stuff and people's impressions of physics is you just think about stuff. Well, by golly, it turns out we make stuff in physics. Who knew? We put these testimonials, and I'll show you some, um, on our website. Our website is like a lot of department websites. Uh, not Your, your website is actually very nice. Uh, ours was not. Our website was really for other research faculty at other campuses. That's its primary audience. So we tried to make a website that was the primary audience was undergraduates. Um, and then if students were saying they wanted to be able to know what you could do with it, with a physics major, we had, a, a for the first time, a design course. I'll talk about that a little bit. And then we asked alumni from our department to come back and tell us about the career choices you could go into with a physics major. And some of them are doing some crazy things. Some of them work for the dairy, the dairy industry, and they're modeling futures prices. Some of them are working for a sports company, they're making baseball bats. I mean, they're doing a lot of stuff with a physics major. Turns out, by golly, there's a lot you can do. And then we invited high school kids a lot to um, to our campus. Right about the time that it would be that they were choosing which college they would attend, we invited them for sleepovers, and they could shadow physics students on campus. And that turned out to be really successful too. Another piece of feedback is that. Physics professors apparently have no passion for physics, which is kind of odd because they're physics professors, and they make no connections to other sciences and careers. So I tried sharing this focus group with the faculty. You can imagine that was very popular. <laughs> but I asked the faculty, look, if you could just try to talk about how your research gets into the topic that you're teaching about. Obviously, we all choose the classes we teach, and we do it because we think they're kind of connected. I like to teach quantum mechanics because it's related to particle physics or some of my colleagues like to teach E&M because it's related to lasers, and that's what they do. I mean, there's lots of opportunities. We could be taking debate and actually talking about why it is we got involved in physics. We just don't. We also tried to make connections between the students and the faculty. So we try to create things like a regular lunch uh, hour that happens once a month or once every three weeks where the faculty were invited and the students were invited. Most of our students only saw the faculty during course periods. That's not a very effective means for finding out who's a good mentor for you as a student. We had nothing else for outside contact time. This is a really key one. Um, we used to make all of our teaching selections as faculty based on what we wanted. And then all the really good teachers would pick all the upper division physics classes, and lower division physics classes would get whoever was left. We sort of inverted the order. We sort of started assigning at the undergraduate level at the lower division first, and then it worked our way up. And that's not to say that we ever put bad teachers in the upper division, but we needed to pay special attention to those gateway classes that can also be attractor classes. <coughs> this is a, one of the few curricular changes that we made. Um, some, a lot of students said, look, there's such a big disconnect between what we heard about physics in high school and what we actually ended up doing when we got to campus. 
we tried to move modern physics as early as we possibly could. So we had a modern physics class. It was for essentially late sophomores or early juniors, and we made it a third semester class. So now it's available to someone who's a first semester fresh, a first semester sophomore. I teach that class now, and I've had to revise it. It can no longer assume Fourier transforms, and it can no longer assume differential equations, and it can no longer assume statistical mechanics, all of which apparently were assumed in the previous incarnation of this course. It was a beautiful course as it previously existed. You could do everything at great theoretical detail for a modern physics class, except, by golly, to wait till you're a junior to learn about wave-particle duality, that's just a darn shame, right? Because that's kind of fun. Um, and then we worked on really allowing for different kinds of degrees than the kind of degree that most of us who are faculty ended up getting when we were in college. There's, in many college campuses, just one and only one bachelor's of science in physics. But in other colleges, there are six or eight different bachelor's degrees. We instituted a, a biophysics degree. They won't have to take that senior quantum mechanics class that I teach in particle physics. Darn. But they're going to be good, good biophysicists. We've had for a while a space physics option, but it wasn't really utilized all that well. Why? Because we didn't really promote it as valuable. But it turns out in Texas, that, that's a good career. Uh, we have a computational physics option, and we never really promoted it as well all, all that much. But gosh, computational science is the biggest thing in the 21st century. It's bigger than biology. Why aren't we doing that? We have a radiation physics option. We never really promoted that, and yet what a lost opportunity because our mechanical engineering department has a huge radiation or nuclear engineering uh, program, and they have faculty over there who are really eager to work with us. And we're finally building nuclear reactors again. This should be an area where we promote. So it, it turns out to be really important to appeal uh, to students with a variety of options. Not every student wants to go marching off to the monastery and be the next faculty member. They want to know what they can do with their physics major. And so it requires options. And that gives me great pain because I want them all to take my senior quantum mechanics where I teach them about elementary particles, but they don't all want that. Darn. And then there was just this overwhelming feeling, I feel lost in a sea of complicated physics. So we needed to provide support mechanisms. And these are really important too. So I created an undergraduate peer assistant program. A lot, this is not rocket science because most campuses are doing it, and you probably all do it here. We hired our upper division students to be the mentors for the lower division students. While we have great graduate TAs and they surely know a lot of physics, the undergraduate TAs that now serve our, undergraduate, our lower division physics courses are great mentors because they were the people who just got through that course the semester before. We held weekly cram sessions. Uh, I call them midnight cram sessions, but they, t they were only at 9 o'clock. Uh, every Sunday night, the Society for Physics students was assisting me in helping just have cram sessions for physics. I asked all the faculty if they would be willing to lead tutorial sessions for their classes. We had never done that before. Where I went to college, the faculty always had tutorial sessions. It's a great opportunity to just talk informally with students and then help them, by golly. And then we did crazy stuff that had nothing to do with academics, but have everything to do with blowing off steam and letting people know that you actually care about their progress. So. That open house that we talked about, I decided to measure little g by dropping watermelons off of the, the building that we live in. And that's a 17-story building. So little g has a big impact when it gets to the bottom. Uh, we had movies, uh, movies at, in our department, and then we had lectures about movies. So I gave a talk about uh, the movie Angels and Demons. Uh, a lot of particle physicists were talking about that. I gave another talk about the movie 2012, which has some really bad science in it, too. Um, Hollywood never fails to come out with movies that allow us to poke fun at them. So we should take that bait because the students love it. They saw those movies. We, um, we did a lot of work with local schools outreach, but not because I wanted to increase pipeline. It's because I wanted the undergraduates to get involved in that outreach. I wanted them to feel really proud of something that they knew that younger kids didn't know. And that turned out to take two years just to get the students willing to do it. But by golly, when they were empowered in that way, like they knew something the younger kids didn't know, they wouldn't let go. They, they were excited about being a physics major. And in Austin, we had another opportunity that it, it's a local thing, but we have a group called Architac, which is a, it's essentially a rock band. It's a bunch of failed electrical engineers who have these Tesla coils about as tall as the ceiling here, and they put them up to 
they hook them up to audio amplifiers so the power on these Tesla coils goes on and off at audio frequencies and it actually makes an, a, a pitch as the, as the arc goes through the air. So imagine 30-foot 30 bolt, 30 bolts of lightning uh, from these 500 kilovolt uh, Tesla coils playing different musical pitches like Super Mario Brothers or something like that. It's pretty spectacular. So there's the t-shirt. Um, you probably can't read it in the back of the room, thank goodness. Uh, it's a quote that makes everyone want to have a t-shirt. Um, for all the freshmen, we gave away the t-shirt. We had a barbecue at the beginning of the year. Gosh, that seems like such a good thing to do. Uh, this is a picture from the ground floor of the building when we had that uh, open house. And that was loud. Um, as I say, there were a thousand people going through our building. At the same time, we had a poster session. All the undergraduates who were doing research were invited to give a poster on what they were doing, just to give against the sense that undergraduates do research. There's my banners. Those were about uh, 15 feet long, and they just feature some of our uh, physics majors who are doing different things. And we had some, some public lectures that drew lots of kids that weren't necessarily physics majors, but they were glad to hear about physics and its relevance to angels and demons and ending the Vatican. The conference course turned out to be extremely popular. Uh, all of our freshmen wanted to take it, and I couldn't get enough seats, so we had to create more and more sections. Any opportunity where physics majors could start to ask questions rather than sit there and listen obediently uh, in lecture was really welcome. And I was really excited whenever we could start to get majors involved in doing actual outreach because it, again, made them proud to be a physics major. Uh, I already talked about measuring little g. Let me do that again. Ah, those was, that's those Tesla coils. So let's see. Um, this is the website for the undergraduate program. So it's not written in academic language. You know, when you read about courses on an academic catalog, it tends to be like a bunch of keywords and you do physics because you learn about Hamiltonians and rotational dynamics and a bunch of keywords that we faculty know about, but it doesn't really speak to what, a, what an undergraduate would want, want to know. And we spent a lot of time developing uh, as part of this website, real explicit demonstrations of what you do in careers and once you have a physics major. This happens to be a person who had a software company. Uh, but you know, equally well, there were this, the representatives on there who worked for Cisco or the people who had, had that sports company and made baseball bats. It was really important to me that people know that you can do other stuff with a physics major. And then we started to write about our courses in ways that made them sound fun in and of themselves. I don't mean to make everything sound trivial and fun, but you know, there has to be a point to taking junior kinemat or mechanics in and of itself. It can't always be the gateway to the next course because otherwise you always feel like you're doing a bait and switch, that there's never a good thing about the course you're actually taking. The cool stuff is always at the end of the road and the end of the road never comes because the world is a sphere. <laughs> and this is what our advertising looked like. There were flyers like this in Germanic studies, as I said. So this features a couple of our physics majors. Um, this, this tagline was everywhere, and it became an inside joke, and it became an external joke. The physicists were the, the why people. But that was our tagline, is the why keeping you up at night? Us too, UT Physics. And so we would then introduce various physics majors, in this case, Leah Hesla. And then we would start writing about why physics, and we just provided a narrative. This was the bottom of that flyer. The back of this flyer it did something extremely important, and it went exactly after all of those negative statements that people made about physics and hit them head on. So some of them included things like, I'm going to medical school, and there's no way physics is the right thing for me. Well, we happen to live in the state that has the MD Anderson Proton Accelerator Therapy Center. That's an ironic statement to make in Texas. Certainly, there are lots of physicists involved in medicine. Getting a degree in physics will take too long. Well, in our college, actually, that's a great, that's a great uh, setup because the Bachelor's of Arts in Physics is considerably shorter, and so is the Bachelor of Science than going for a Bachelor's in Biochemistry. So false, false statement. Physics is just too hard. Well, yes, it's hard in a certain way. But again, it's hard because it's mathematically challenging. It's not hard like biology where you have to learn the textbook, which is this thick. That's a different kind of hard. Or, I'm just not sure I'm going to commit to this program. This is where I set up my $500 scholarship. So we try to go after the direct challenges to the major, because if, if you avoid them, then they still persist out there. 
And we had lots of these testimonials featuring a lot of our students. There are no faculty on these flyers. These are all about the students. So you know, this is a young man who's now in California doing material science. That's a person who's in our UTeach program. He's a UTeach program as well. He's at MIT doing plasma physics. She's working for a startup energy company. They're all doing stuff, and we were able to write about what it is that they wanted to do. So let me just say a little bit about this before I wind up. Um, there's some real meeting of the minds that has to happen in a campaign like this. Faculty come to this kind of discipline because they love their subject. And they come to love teaching eventually, but I'll be the first to admit, I got to be a professor because I love particle physics. It's, it became eventually the case that I thought of myself as a teacher and a mentor. But that isn't our first entree into our profession often. Departments don't always agree that students are the customer. That, becomes, that takes some time. And unless the whole department buys in, it's hard to institutionalize any kind of effort like this. I will say that data is key. I could make all this stuff up and people wouldn't believe me, but the fact that I had piles of focus group research and I could just say, look, this is what one third of our students say. Do we really want to discount it or is it, is it data we're willing to accept? If you're dealing with an external set of language like marketing, and if you happen to go this route of hiring a consultant as we did, it actually has some challenges too, but it actually turned out to be a great thing. Market researchers don't speak our language and they don't accept our arguments. And so we have to explain it over and over again until it makes sense. That turns out to be a really good thing to do. So even without, even in the absence of hiring market researchers, as you try to identify a reason for being and a reason for your department and a, not that you don't have a reason for your department, but if you try to articulate a reason for a department, it's really helpful to try that message over and over again on an, a sympathetic audience that isn't necessarily going to accept your line of reasoning up front. They need, you need independent ears because we are communicating in a space that's much bigger than we're used to. It will tend to change the dynamic of who's the customer. The other comment I'll make is one has to be prepared for the success. In our case, we literally doubled the size of our department. Now it's the case that upper division courses are full. Labs are full. Faculty have to teach bigger classes. We have to rethink how we're going to do lower division because we have so many majors. We have a lot of regroup to do. So success has its implications. And the market researcher that I worked with warned me of this at the beginning, and I, I did this. I didn't pay attention. Uh, now we're dealing with it. So just know that that will require changes. I will say if you do hire a market researcher, your colleagues will never look at you the same ever again. OK. So there's no rocket science here. There's lots and lots of little pieces. It's about finding out what students are thinking, asking what you can do to meet them at their, at their side of the debate, and then taking the debate to the target audiences, because this isn't about marketing to ourselves. I'm going to keep going because I know I'm behind here. And then I want to get back to uh, the other word here, which is community. All the things I've talked about are in various ways about building community. And where I felt like I had started to make a difference is when I was known personally to the high school teachers in the area, when the high school kids in the area saw me at the movie theater and said, oh, you gave a lecture at our school last week, or when the freshmen in biology knew who I was, or when I was known in a diverse group of audiences and all of these people knew about physics, that's when it starts to make a sink. It's, it's when things start to move in the same direction. Because fundamentally what I believe we're trying to do as educators is take four years of someone's life, offer them a rewarding experience that allows them to grow into the next stage of their life, and for this four years, be their academic home. We are doing something that's really fundamental at a stage of someone's life. And yet we tend to treat courses in isolation. I teach my junior course, you teach your senior course, someone else teaches the freshman course. But there's very little reward structure within the university for looking at 
the four-year experience as a whole. Departments tend to work by course. Uh, colleges tend to work by department. And someone needs to oversee the four years. And that seemed to be something that took a while for us to click. Oh, I'm going to skip over that. Um, there are other things that will click, but no, I don't have time. Let me just show you some data. Um, this data is incomplete because this represents our growth in majors at the beginning of this academic year. I can now tell you we're slightly over 350. We had been at 200 majors for quite some time and grew to about here. So we haven't quite doubled, but we're hoping to. I will tell you there's one uh, personal disappointment in this data. The places that we managed to recruit from were largely from engineering. That's a victory in a small way because we were seen as the landing spot for people who couldn't get into engineering for a long time. And now there's an awful lot of engineers who switch to us, or there's a lot of freshman physics majors who stay with us. That was great, except the engineering college is apparently the only place that is more male dominated than the physics department. And so while we have more majors, we have literally no additional women in the physics department. We are, as a percentage, more male than we were. It's not that we've gone down in the number of women, but our recruiting campaign was entirely unsuccessful amongst the biologist sector of our campus. So whatever messages we developed, that was not an attractive sell. <laughs> not so successful there either. I will tell you that this is part of a broader trend in our college, that uh, our dean, and, and now in my role working for our dean, has been always focused on two really important things for undergraduate education. And they're kind of not what we tend to think about first. In STEM education, we have a couple of really big challenges, particularly at a big campus like UT Austin. One is we're huge, and students need small academic communities to, to park themselves in and feel at home. Because without that, they feel lost in big crowds. And what we've done across our college is, in, in bigger scale, what we were doing in physics. We now create small learning communities for literally all of our freshmen in our 1,800 student freshman class in the College of Natural Sciences. That turns out to be extremely important because freshmen are doing lots of really challenging things. They're adapting to being away from home. Mom isn't doing their laundry anymore. They're having to cook for themselves. They're having to adapt to classes that the pace is different from high schools. There's a lot of stuff happening in freshman year. And the other important thing is early experiential learning. And that's that design class or getting involved in research. All these things tend to be really important in keeping people involved in STEM education. So this graph shows the number of graduates from our college, which has doubled over the last decade. And we've had the same number of freshmen in our college in the last decade. It's not that we're admitting more students, although God knows more are applying. We are simply instituting on a larger and larger scale the two simple themes of early academic community and early experiential learning. And that's more important than just teaching courses. And so I, although I started this talk with lots of t words about marketing, what I think I learned from the end of this was something that is replica replicable elsewhere and was being replicated elsewhere in our college, and that is we need to answer to students' need for a four-year under, undergraduate education, not a piecemeal course-by-course uh, -course experience. And by providing that, I think we provide an academic home that was very attractive to some of our best students. So thank you for your attention. At the time that I was involved in this particular effort, it did not impact uh, physics hardly at all. So let me say a little bit about what Freshman Research Initiative is, and then let me say, tell you that um, since being Associate Dean, uh, we've tried to get more of the Freshman Research Initiative into areas like physics and astronomy and computer science. So uh, University of Texas is indeed touting something called the Freshman Research Initiative. We teach every freshman uh, in the program a research methods course in their first semester of freshman year. And then we get them involved in uh, what we call faculty research streams. So we put them in a lab with a faculty member. And for the faculty member, we try to incentivize this by giving that faculty member a postdoc. 
So if the faculty member is willing to ha sponsor 30 students in real research in their lab, we'll provide a postdoc who acts as the, the go-between between, between a very large collection of students and the faculty uh, research topic. Now that lends itself really well to biology where everyone needs to stir a different test tube and the research project is which, which compound is the right one. In physics, this is challenging. So we did not at this time have a lot of freshman research initiative streams in physics, but we have since developed ideas that are appealing to physics majors. So two new ones that have emerged in the last year, we have a, um, an astronomer who does computational galaxy formation. So anyone who's a computer scientist, an astronomer, or a physicist would find that a very natural and attractive stream to be involved in. In fact, that's already full. We have another stream that uh, will do remote telescope operation um, at the McDonald Observatory. So we have some small telescopes sitting out there and they're going to start pro learning to program and learning all the ins and outs of following, tracking the stars and all that. And that's again meant to be attracted to physics and astronomy and, and computer science majors. Um, we weren't able to have that for this effort, but I think once we see it blossom in all the departments, it will only extend the impact of this because freshman research initiative, um, just to give you some other statistics, has led to a 50% increase in graduation rates for the participants in that program. So when we created that program, it started out very small. It is now 600 students in our college. There are 800 applicants in a typical year. So we, we throw the dice and set, take 600 out of 800 applicants. The other 200 for us researchers is a great control group. So the graduation rates amongst the students in freshman research initiative is 50% higher. And that's not a self-selection bias. That's a against a control. And it indicates that early engagement in research is really instrumental. So, yeah. To better, to better service courses, you mean? Uh, that's true. So I think we've paid a lot of attention to our service courses in a way that we had not. Um, several of our faculty have uh, adopted a curriculum you may be familiar with called Matter Interactions, and that's being used for all of our engineering courses now. I think that's been a real revitalization for our lower division physics courses. Uh, I'm excited to hear to think about the day when we'll stop dropping little blo blocks of metal and measuring little g in undergraduate physics labs and we'll start doing computer modeling because that's what all the engineers actually need to be able to do. So yes, I believe it's done that and I think the pedagogy has improved because of this uh, implementation of undergraduate teaching assistants. That fundamentally changes the style of instruction. So a lot of our faculty are now using so-called peer instruction, which I'm sure you may have heard of. And uh, several of our faculty are using um, a homebrew uh, learning management system that UT Austin developed called Quest. So if you've heard in, in edu world of flipping the classroom, the idea of taping all your lectures online, having the students watch that, actually has some, some rudimentary problems online as well so that when you come into class, you know what they've done online and what they've mastered online, and now you can start using the class as a problem-solving session. So the, the nexus of all these things has been a new curriculum, uh, a new learning management platform to encourage that active learning, and then undergraduate peer assistance to, to change the style of classroom instruction. I think all these things, have, they're not being used by every single faculty member, but these are all really positive changes, I think. It might be your experience as well, but we'd never have enough graduate TAs to staff all of our courses. So in some courses, we literally only have undergraduate TAs. My sophomore modern physics class, I only have undergraduate TAs. In other courses, we use the graduate students as a supervisor of multiple undergraduate TAs. 
and that has allowed us to go a little further. It's not that we want to reduce the number of graduate TAs, it's just that we've never had enough, and now with larger and larger number of students uh, taking physics courses, we need to, to stretch the same dollar. So yes, it's cost of change. Fabulous job. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that was informative. Yeah.